15. But we'll start today and look at a scripture in Matthew's gospel, uh, chapter uh, number 21. Uh, Matthew's gospel, we're going to start there and then we're going to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We welcome you today. We're glad that you are in the service. and May the Lord bless and uh, speak to you through his word. I do appreciate the singing today. Appreciate each one, their willingness, and may the Lord just continue to uh, meet with us this morning. Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 21. You look with us today, as we mentioned earlier, if you were to look at a calendar day, most of them probably don't mention it anymore, but when I was a young person, if you looked at a calendar, on the calendar today it would say Palm Sunday. For us as Christians, for us as churchgoers, we know what that means, we know what that has come to um, it, the, scripturally why it's called that. Now, I don't know exactly what day of the week. The Bible doesn't tell us uh, what day of the week. It tells us uh, according to certain things that we, we guess. And so man is taken and doing calculations and figuring uh, starts and stops in the stories in the Scripture. We've come up and we filled in this entire week and we call it Holy Week. I don't know why it was, but my mother would always like to go to church on Palm Sunday. I don't know why that was special. We didn't go typically on Easter, but she would want to go to church on Palm Sunday. That was the day that we would often go to church as children. And we did not go to church very often, so it was a special day. Um, Palm Sunday is the day when we look at in the Scripture and we we assign the days of the week and it works out to where, depending on what day and how you study and how you understand which day of the week Christ was crucified, it lines up to where Christ was crucified on Friday uh, and uh, in, in the, the, the calculations that people have come back. So going back from there, they come back to this day that we read about being Sunday in the Scripture. The Bible says in the book of Matthew, chapter number 21, we will read more Scripture today than we will, we will comment and speak, but I, I just want to let these verses just, I want to do that today. I want to emphasize Again and again, the scripture this morning. So Matthew's gospel, chapter number 21. Many of you would have a caption that says something about the entry into the city. The Bible says, When they drew nigh to Jerusalem, and were come to Bethpods, and to the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied, and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man... Say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went, and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put upon them their coats, their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitude that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he's coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Verse 12, And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves, and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. We'll stop our reading right there. And the blind and the lame came into the temple and he healed them. As we start this story in Matthew's Gospel chapter number 21, you'll go through the remainder of the passages that will lead you all the way to Matthew chapter number 27. At the end of Matthew chapter number 27, you will find that the Bible says that Christ has been crucified. He has been taken down from the cross. His body has been wrapped and he has been laid in a tomb. There's been a rock placed, a stone placed in front of that tomb, and that is where the scene ends. And from where I read to you this morning, when Christ enters into the city, until that 
until that fateful day when we see that Christ has died and He has been buried and He waits in the tomb and the stone has been affixed there for a seal and for security and, for the, and just for the fulfillment of the Scripture, we find what we call Holy Week. You'll hear more about it this week than you will any other week of the year. You'll hear more about all these different things. You'll hear about them over and over again. And they will continually, as you turn your Bible to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and they will continually say, uh, the, tr- the Christian tradition, and Christians traditionally believe, and, and according to tradition, this is the day that Christ entered in on, on Monday, on Palm Sunday, or Monday, Thursday, or Good Friday, or on all the way through to the resurrection day on the first day of the week. They will continually make reference to these things. They'll be, they'll be accommodating. They'll be, they'll be promoting those things. They'll, they'll share their traditions and their, their, their involvement. Even, even the most secular, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean the, the, the same network that gives, thank God, gives the, the rest of the world the view every single morning. Last night was playing Carlton Heston and the Ten Commandments. Why? Because it's what they call Holy Week. It's that beginning where they feel like, according to the demographic and statistics, people who any other week wouldn't care about it, they'll even watch. And and the advertisers will buy advertising on this week of the year to play uh, uh, the Ten Commandments and, and Moses and these different things. The world has this attune. The world has this acceptance. This week. This is the week when, when, when folks accept and tolerate, if you will, all, all what people think are the traditions of Easter and Christianity. I'm here to tell you today, I don't preach traditions. I don't, I don't hold to traditions. My Bible is full of time and time again, uh, God's people are uh, coming to take away traditions. And it advise that men are wrong to adhere to those traditions. My Bible says if you will turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. My Bible says that what we celebrate today and what we'll celebrate all this week and all the way into the first day of next week, we don't celebrate tradition, we celebrate the Scriptures today. Amen? That is where our basis is. And we need to know that. We need to know that because the basis takes away tradition and nostalgia and the Scripture brings us to the reality Christ died for our sins. Oh, they'll talk all week long about about the celebration and about the nostalgia and the history of Christ dying. But nobody will mention that Christ died for a reason. And the reason he died was not martyrdom. The reason he died was not religious uh, jealousy and zealousy. The reason he died was not because he was outnumbered and outmanned and out, out, outpowered. No, the reason he died was he died for our sins. That's why he died. And all the world will tolerate and all the world will accommodate everything to talk about the, cry, the cross and Christ as long as they don't mention that little word, sin. But I want you to know today, we'd have no cross were it not for our sins. We'd have no resurrected Savior were it not for our sins. We don't celebrate our sin, but we have to understand sin and the consequences of sin is the entirety of of the reason why God sent His Son. That's why we have Christmas was because God was preparing a lamb to shed His blood that the, sin, that the sins of the world could be forgiven or have remission or be taken away or cleansed as you sang a while ago. We've got to acknowledge all this is a result of sin. But nobody sins. There is no sin. And they might sin, but I don't sin, so there's no reason to talk about sin when we talk about Easter. So we'll just talk about Christ crucified and we'll we'll pick out those noble principles that He lived by and that and that meekness that He demonstrated. And all those are wonderful. You'll never find it anywhere else like it was in Him. But my friend, Christ died for our sins. Look at your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. The Bible said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Hallelujah. 
I declare unto you the gospel. My friend Paul was writing to a church uh, some 2,000 years ago and men or women today are still mounting the pulpit and drawing together in Sunday school classes and uh, congregating in the choir that we might share the gospel. Amen. The gospel. Our message haven't changed. Sometimes our methods change. Not always to the good. And our, our manners change. But the message has never changed. And we cannot let the message change. And he said, I declare unto you the gospel. What is the gospel? The, by, the definition of the word says good news. Good news. Thank God it is good news. It is good news. What is that good news? That Christ died for our sins. That is good news. That's the best news you'll ever hear. That's the, that's the news you've got to hear when you find yourselves as what we are. Sinners headed for an eternal hell without the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And my friend, the Bible said, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth Him should not perish but have everlasting life today. The Bible says in the book of Galatians chapter 4, who gave Himself for our sins that He might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God. Christ's death was according to the will of God. But He didn't leave it for us just to guess was it God's will? Was this really what God wanted? No, He wrote it down. Time and time again, He wrote it down. Why He died. Not just, my friend, that He died, but why He died. Ladies and gentlemen, Christ died on the cross for our sins. For our sins. Look at your Bibles, verse 1. Brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you have also received, and wherein do you stand? There's a verse to preach, men. The gospel's been preached. The gospel's been received. And, and the gospel, our friend, is where we stand. I'm, I stand in one place today. I stand on the gospel. The good news. That, what is the good news? He's about to give you the good news. The good news is by, in verse number 2, he said, by the which you are also saved. Amen. Amen. By how are you saved? I'm saved by the gospel. I'm saved by the gospel which was preached and was received. And where I put my trust today, I don't trust anything else but Jesus Christ. That's the only trust I have for eternity. That's the only trust I have beyond this world is what Christ did for me on the cross. That's the only place we can trust. That's the only thing there is to trust is Jesus Christ. But notice where he, he goes. He said, for I delivered, in verse number, I'm sorry, in verse number 3, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I received. Here it is. How that Christ died for our sins. And I love what he said next. According to the Scriptures. According to the Scriptures. Oh, I love the next verse. But that's next week. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day. According to the the Scriptures. Amen? It is not tradition. It is not nostalgia. It is not history. Uh, it is not uh, 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 traditional. Uh, <laughs> I've been to Israel several times and, I, and when you go around Israel and they take you to these places, they say this is the traditional site. In other words, well, this one makes people get goosebumps and they feel good, but we don't really know what happened here. And when they, when they bring up that tradition, they're saying, we don't, we don't know if it happened, doubt that it did, but this is where folks like to talk about it. Amen? I'm here to tell you today, <laughs> I don't know if I've been to Calvary. I've been to two different places in Israel where they say Christ was crucified. And it don't matter if I go to 50 places. It don't matter. Because I want you to know today, I've been to Calvary. <laughs> I've been to Calvary. And I didn't need a passport. I didn't need to leave Lawrenceville. Matter of fact, I went to Calvary from Montgomery, Alabama. Amen? You can get there from Alabama. 
That's, that's hard, to, but you can. Thank God. I've been to Calvary. And I, I, friend, I'm just here to tell you, it's not a physical location. It is what Christ did for me. And I know He did it somewhere. And yes, it was in Jerusalem, somewhere outside the gate of the city. But what matters is that He did it according to the Scriptures. According to the Scriptures. That's all I got today. According to the Scriptures. That thrills me. Because we live in this world. A man always trying to add meaning, take away meaning. I just want you to hear something today. I hope you get saved. There's people in this room that need to be saved. There's people here that need to quit, quit uh, uh, messing around and quit denying the reality that we are lost sinners and we need a Savior. And Jesus is the only Savior. And He's the only one who saved. But we understand all that we know is according to the Scriptures. So I can't fathom why you don't want to hear the Scriptures. And I understand something. I want to hear it again and again and again. And, and listen, listen. We need to be saved. We know we do. All have sinned and come short. of The glory of God. Everybody has sinned. Boys and girls, mom and dad, granny and gramps, we've all sinned. We've all sinned. The wages of sin is death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Sin has consequences. Death. Not just physical death. If you live long enough, everybody's going to die. You had not met anybody yet who hadn't died. Everybody's going to die. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. Physical death. But that's, not, that's, that's, the, that's the easy part. The eternal death is the terrible part. The eternal death lasts forever. The eternal death never changes. The eternal death is what the consequences of sin is. According to the Scripture. How would I know that I've sinned? Because my mama loves me. My grandma used to take me for pancakes every time she set eyes on me. She loved me. How would I know that I'm a sinner? I've got friends. I've got family. They love me. They can't get on without me. They love me. How would I know that I'm a sinner? I could, I could say I, according to the Scripture. According to the Scriptures. I know that I've sinned. Even if I never understood it. Even if I could never see it in my own self. The Scriptures declare that I have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. Christ died for our sins. According to the Scriptures. The Scriptures give us the truth. And, and what I want. I keep, getting, I keep getting sidetracked. And I'm guilty. And you're guilty. And if you've ever been in an invitation. You're guilty. If you've ever tried to tell somebody about the Lord, you're probably guilty because we all want to make it so personal and we all want to make it so touchy-feely and we all want to say, don't you just want to get saved and don't you want to, don't you want to invite Jesus into your heart and don't you want to ask the Lord to come into your heart and don't, and, and don't you want to... Uh, don't, and all that, it's, it's just a way for us to try to explain something we can't explain. But can I say to you today, we really don't have to explain it because we have the Scriptures. We have the Scriptures. And the Scriptures didn't say to ask Jesus into your heart. Start looking. I know you're looking right now. Go ahead. He's not in there. It's what we do and after we've been saved and we understand what happened. But what we need to do is, is, is tell somebody how to be saved according to the Scriptures. We tell them they're lost according to the Scriptures and then we want to go into our own words. And we, I, we understand that, right? We're, it's, it's, a, it's a fearful thing. It's an, oftentimes an emotional thing. It's a, it's a, it's a very... It's just intense and we're just trying with all of our vocabulary to try to explain because if we just explain it, they'll get it and they'll get saved and we want them to be saved. I understand that, that, that urgency. But we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful. And we need to say what we've been preaching the last several weeks about how to get saved. It's according to the Scriptures. It's repent. Paul said, watch what Paul says right here. Here's, here's what amazes me. I want to look at this just for a little bit. He said, For I delivered first of you how that I received, how that Christ died for our sins. Now, I want to take for just a minute, I want to take a couple of examples. In the book of Luke, the day of the resurrection, Jesus Christ 
is speaking to those Emmaus disciples. And their heart broke. And they, they can't imagine what's happened. And they, can't, they, they, they thought Christ would have never died. And that, he would have, uh, uh, that if He did, that, that it wouldn't have been like this. And, all. and so Christ preaches them. And here's what the Lord says in Luke 24. These are the words I spake unto you while I was with you. And all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he other understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. And after they had an understanding of the Scriptures, here's what Christ said to them. Christ said in, Matthew, in Luke 24, 46, He said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Repentance is a part of salvation. Repentance is how salvation comes. We have to repent. And that we preach that and we talk about it. We have to have a change of thinking. It's easy to think I don't need a Savior. It's easy to think this is as good as being saved. It's easy to think a lot of things. What we've got to do is change our thinking. Our thinking lines up with Scriptures. And when our thinking lines up with Scripture, we see ourselves lost. We need to be saved. We repent. Yes, there should be a remorse for sinful conduct. But again, there's no way to measure how to be sorry enough. It's repent. It's change our thinking about who Christ is, who the Lord is, who I am, what salvation means. I need to, because I think I can earn it. I think as long as I'm better than somebody else, I'm okay. Listen, you can be better than somebody else, but you're not okay. You cannot earn it. How do we know that? According to the Scriptures. Christ died for our sins. And I have told you before, uh, that, that, was the, that was the key. And it might be the key that gets your heart. But that was the key when my dad got saved. And I said to my father, if, if just living as good as you lived was good enough, then why did God send His Son to die for us? Because my dad had listed all and extolled all his values and virtues and why he thought he was as good as any. I said, Dad, if that was all that God required, then why did Christ die on the cross? And it was the most wonderful time I've ever had to see the light go off in somebody's spirit. My dad went from pleading his case to pour it out as a puddle on the floor and ask God to save him. You know what my dad did right there that he had never done? He repented. He changed the way he was thinking. We've got to repent. We've got to repent. We've got to see ourselves as lost. For we'll ever see the need for a Savior. I, tell you, I say it all the time, my dad, my dad got lost. And about 30 seconds after he got lost, he got saved. And, and, and it was just such, such, such a thrilling. I, I can't not talk about it. Because it, it was so, it was just so real to see how the Lord blessed and worked. He was according to the Scriptures. Christ died for our sins according. I want to go somewhere. Look, Jesus. Jesus takes the example. And he says, in repentance, and remission of sins should be preached in His name. Now watch. Alright, we've got the day of Pentecost. We know in Acts 2 that Peter said, they come to say, Peter, what should we do? And what the Lord said, repent. What did Peter say? Repent. But I, I want to I pick up in Acts, in Acts 3. Again, Peter is preaching. And Peter says this, But those things which God had showed by the mouth of all His prophets that Christ should suffer, He hath so fulfilled. Peter is preaching. What does he say? Everything that God said, according to his prophets, he's fulfilled in Christ. Then when Peter said that, what did he tell them to do? Acts 3, verse 18, verse, or verse 19, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. He said, I, I'm here to tell you. I'm, you don't have to feel like you want to ask Jesus into your heart. You don't, have to, you don't have to make Him Lord. You don't have to do anything. But you do have to repent. Repent. Peter, 
is preaching, the Holy Ghost has come, and as Peter preaches, and he says everything that the Scripture said has happened, and now what do you need to do? Repent. What we need to do is preach the Scriptures. Preach the Scriptures. What God said was going to happen, happened. And what do we need to do with that reality? Repent. Change our way of thinking. Repent. So then, now, now Paul, I, I showed you Christ saying that everything that the Bible said was going to happen has happened. I showed you Peter saying everything that the Bible said was going to happen, happened. Now let's look at Paul. Paul in the book of Acts 17. Paul says this in Acts chapter 17. Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them three days, reasoned with them, out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ, or is the Anointed One, or is the Messiah. Paul says, I, I'm preaching, and as I'm preaching, here's what I'm telling. I'm telling them that everything that the Bible said about Christ has taken place. And what do you need to do? You need to repent. You need to repent. And uh, then look at what Paul testified. Go back to where we've been for the last month. Go back to Acts 26. Say, preacher, you may, you turn, you're supposed to just take one text and just, I know, I, but understand, I didn't just not do good in school. I didn't go to school. I apologize. Acts chapter number 26. Look at us right there. Look at Acts 26 where we preached for the, all last month we preached out of Acts 26. And look in Acts 26 in verse number 22. Look what Paul says. Look what Paul says about what he did. We read his preaching. Now Paul's going to talk about his preaching. And guess what? What he says about his preaching lines up with his preaching. But under, in, in Acts 26, as Paul is testifying before Agrippa, and uh, look at verse number 20. Paul, remember what he said to them? He said, there's only one thing I tell them. In verse number 20, that they should repent, turn to God, and do, meet work, do works meet for repentance. And then look at verse 22. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day witnessing both to small and to great. You know what that says to me? I know he's talking about powerful and unpowerful. But I say to boys and girls and to moms and dads, small and great, big and small, it doesn't matter who you are. You need to hear the message. Here's the message. Saying none other things than those things which the prophets and Moses did say should come. What did they say? That Christ should suffer. And that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. We've got a message to preach. It's a message of repentance. It's a message of repentance. We've got a message to preach. It is that everything that the Lord said about his son has come to pass. Everything that he said has happened. All what the prophet said, all what the psalmist said, all, all what Moses said has come to pass. And I know we get, we get in the deep weeds trying to make it palatable, trying to make it relatable, trying to make it like, like, we, like we, we, we feel it and we're all on the same team. But listen, the message is Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. That will never mean anything to anybody who's not a sinner bound for hell. That's just a sad story that happened to somebody else a long time ago in a place far from here. But when you see yourselves as what we are, sinners who need a Savior, without a Savior, we're headed for an eternity in punishment and darkness and the absence of God. When we see ourselves, then we need somebody. What do we need? We need a Savior. We need one who died for our sins. Not because the preacher said, but according to the Scriptures. According to the Scriptures. You ought to hold that Bible. And I, I know you can read it on a, on a screen, but it, it, it will never be the same. It will never be the same. It will say the same thing. It is the same truth. But it is just something about holding it in your hand. 
and turning that page and seeing those truths. And I thank the Lord. Christ should suffer. Yes, it's a sad story y'all Christians talk about. It, 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 it's great theater. Oh, it, it tugs on the heartstrings. Oh, it, listen, it may do all those things. But that's not important. What is important is Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. The Scripture said we needed a Savior. The Scripture said there would be a Savior. The Scripture said He is the Savior. The Scripture said there is no other Savior. The Scripture said the Savior's coming back. The Scripture said the Savior's going to judge. The Scripture said the Savior's going to take us to a place that is like nothing else we have ever imagined in every thought and every, every idea we've ever had. It's not even close. The Scripture says it. And we preach according to the Scriptures. And next week we're going to preach on the resurrection according to the Scriptures. We preach according to the Scriptures. And we have to keep emphasizing and emphasizing and emphasizing that. But Paul in Acts 26, as he's preaching, remember we brought this up, this, this showed up last week. And so what did Paul ask Agrippa after he's done what the Lord did after He's done what Peter's done. After He's done what He's done. All of His ministry. He says to Agrippa, Agrippa, don't you want to ask Jesus in your heart? It's not what He said, is it? Here we see a plea to a lost man. We see a biblical plea to a lost man from a saved man. And He does not ask him, do you want to ask Jesus into your heart? It's easier. What did, he ask, what did he ask Agrippa? He said, Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? <laughs> you know what he's asking him? Do you believe the Word of God? And what did Agrippa do? Agrippa turned it around. Agrippa turned it around. And Agrippa said, almost. You persuade me to be a Christian. Hmm. <clears throat> We, we, we begin to turn things around. Paul's emphasis to him was not, don't you want to be a Christian? He's emphasizing to him, do you believe this book? Do you believe the prophets? I want to read to you one more place out of the Scripture. Out of the book of, uh, um, I think it's Galatians. Let me make sure I get it right. Uh, I, I wanted to read. No, it's Peter. It's 1 Peter chapter 9. One, listen to what Peter says. This, we, we've read this, and we, but, but listen to it. Break it down close. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Watch this now. Of which salvation? The prophets. 1 Peter 1, verse 9. Now I'm in verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now, if I let this verse say what it says right here, it says that while those old men <laughs> were writing those prophecies and preaching to those people way back over in the Old Testament, that they were just wishing they could understand what they were writing about. They were wishing they could know what day and what time and who it was going to be. They, they had to, the Bible said the Spirit of God was in them. <laughs> the Spirit of God was in them. And they were writing and they were testifying and they were prophesying. And they were saying all the time, man, I wish I could figure this out. But Peter says they were wishing they could figure it out. Peter said the Holy Ghost is opening your eyes. That's what His grace does. That's, that, isn't that what he said? He said testifying of the grace. Look at that verse. Look at that verse in 1 Peter right there. He said, I, I, I keep losing that verse. Searching of what or what manner of time the Spirit which was in them did signify which it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ. The Spirit was testifying beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. 
You know what I see in verse 11? I see, <laughs> I see the crucifixion and I see the resurrection. The sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. <laughs> and those Old Testament saints and those prophets and those songwriters and as they were writing, the, the Bible said the Spirit was in them putting down the right thing. But they just wished they could understand it. My Bible says the angels have desired to look over and to see what's going on in this, in this age of grace. But I want you to know Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. According to the Scripture. We needed a Savior who would not tell us how to live better, who would not give us a better education, who would not cure all the diseases of earth. We needed a Savior who would not lead a political revolution to where we wouldn't have all that we have in the world today. We needed a Savior who would die for our sins. That's what God sent us. A Savior to die for our sins. Oh, honey, he, he's going to rule. He's going to show you how ruling's done. <laughs> he's going to sit on a throne. It's coming. It's coming. Everything that defiles will be taken out. Instead of everything that defiles is, is, is painted up, put lipstick on it, and bring it in. Everything that defiles is going to be taken out of his kingdom. He's going to do it. But right now, we need a Savior who died for our sins. Christ died for our sins sins. You say, preacher, what do I need to do? Repent. Repent. Rethink this thing. Let the Holy Ghost lead you and turn your thinking to see yourself as a sinner, Him as the Savior, and your sins as eternal without the blood of Christ to, to wash them and to take them away. It takes repentance to do that. You say, preacher, I thought repentance was just feeling bad. Honey, if you do any of that and you don't feel bad, something's wrong with you. You will feel bad. You will see yourself for what you are. How we failed. How we've, how we've totally just, just, just done as bad as, as man could do. But I'm not here to tell you about how bad we are. I'm here to tell you about how good He is. And He died for our sins according to the Scripture. So when you see all the depictions this week, you see all the specials and all the things and all the times that there'll be a, a, a reference and a, and a reenactment or a or portrayal or a, 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 a whatever about the cross, the one thing you probably won't hear much about is Christ died for our sins. Our sins are that bad. Our sins have that big a consequence. That God gave His only begotten Son. You know why He did it? Because He loved us. For God so loved the world. Now we can try to go around the cross. Tell people they ought to be saved because how much God loves them. And why would we do that? When God says, I'm giving you one sign to know that I love you. It's not the weather. It's not the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It's not your last results of your, of your, of your scan. It is not how many children are living and serving God. I gave you one example to know that I love you, sir. And it's on a wall behind me in that baptistry. God commendeth His love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. Hallelujah. 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 He died. He died for my sins. And I don't have to wonder. I don't have to think that's something somebody made up. It's according to the Scripture. I know why He died. He died for my sins according to the Scriptures. Galatians says according to the will of God. God had a plan for my sins. 
for my sins. <laughs> you might be worried. You might want to rejoice that he had a plan on who you was going to marry and how many kids you were going to have and, and where you might live and what you might do. That's wonderful. But if at the end of that plan I still had to die for my sins, how good of a plan was it? No, God's plan is that He died for my sins. That's the greatest part of His plan. Is that He died for my sins. I'm glad He's got a plan for the rest of it. But if it was all going to end in hell, what good would it do? But it's going to end in heaven. So whatever happens today may not be what I wanted. May not be what I even thought I deserved or was going to get. But it's okay. Because when it's over, I'm going to heaven. Because Christ died for my sins. Oh, He... <laughs> if you study your Bible, you'll find where He, he, uh, he bore your sins. And he, he became your sin. And, and He buried your sin. He dealt with my sin. I don't have to deal with there's nothing I could do. In my hand, no price I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. As you stand today and TJ comes with a song of invitation, I want to ask you, how is it with you and your sins and the Savior. Some have figured theirs are not any worse than anybody else's. Some have figured there's still time to deal with it when they get more proof. Some have decided that they, they've done so much more good than, than that little stuff that there's no, there's no worry. May I say to you, you are not the first one to have ever thought that. and You will not be the last one to that has thought that. But it, that could be the last thought you have as you go out into eternity. How terrible that would be that you don't repent. And say, Lord, I need to see you as you see the Savior. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. The Lord hath laid on Him the iniquity of us all. The blood of bulls and heifers cannot take away sin. Christ died for our sin according to the Scripture. I wonder for a man, woman, boy, or girl that's never repented, the Holy Ghost to draw you to Him today. You see the Savior dying for your sin, trusting His sacrifice for your offering. You might know Him forgiveness, the liberty of knowing the Lord. Would you come today? Never been saved, would you come?